So let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for John and Jackie Taylor. We thank you for the service that they do for missionaries all around the world. We pray that you just be with them in their travels. We lift them up, Lord, to you, that you just give them the strength and the spirit of wisdom and truth. We thank you for who you are, Lord. We pray that you just speak through me today. May your spirit just uh, touch the hearts and minds of everyone who is here and listening. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, Pastor Robin spoke on an eight-point sermon. So I figured this week, I'm supposed to do a nine-point sermon. And Jay, we're waiting for a 10-point sermon from you. No, I'm just doing a three-point sermon. It's all right. Here at Oxford, like Pastor Robin said, we're starting a new series, and it's going to have a variety of speakers. So you won't have to see me. You won't need to see him, well, most of him. But the big idea for this series is that Scripture alone teaches us that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And I'm honored to get to go first. So today we're going to be looking at three cornerstone questions that every Christian should know how to answer concerning Scripture. What is Scripture? How can we trust Scripture? And how can we use Scripture? So the big idea for today's sermon is the Bible is the trustworthy truth about God from God. So the first question, what is Scripture? So we'll start by looking at John chapter 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. <coughs> grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but God the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And we'll also take a quick little gander over at John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what is Scripture? Scripture is the truth of God. A quick answer for what is Scripture is Scripture is the Bible as we know it. It's the documentation 
of God's plan for humanity from creation all the way to when the physical body is no longer necessary. It all points towards Jesus, our salvation, and our creator. Scripture doesn't just apply, though, to stories and teachings concerning Jesus. There's also poetry and songs in Scripture. There's prayers, covenants, curses, parables, prophecies, and laws. And something we've run into these days is that my Bible might be different from your Bible, whether it's a different translation or whether or not certain passages get left out or added in. So, how do we know which Bible is Scripture? Do we get to pick and choose what we like so everyone can have their own Bible and their own truth and their own Scripture? Interesting questions, but we'll carry those on into the second segment. So the second question we have is how can we trust Scripture? And so let's turn to Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And then we'll also look over at 2 Peter 1, verse 21. Through him you believed in God, who raised him from the dead. Oh, wrong Peter. Sorry. <clears throat> Second Peter, chapter 1. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So how can we trust the Scripture? Scripture is the truth about God from God. See, we live in a time where news and scientific discoveries from around the world are easily available at our fingertips. But we also live in a time when news and scientific discoveries are prevalent. And to combat this mixture of truth and lies, we are encouraged to do our own homework and test the authenticity of what we hear and see. Can we do something like that with the scriptures today? Can we come to an understanding that the scriptures are the truth of God from God? Well, there are two tests that any skeptic should conduct concerning the scriptures and the source of the scriptures. First, a historical test. What evidence is there that the events that happened in the Bible actually happened? Second, an authorship test. Is there evidence that the words we read today were the original words written at a reliable time? So for the first test, There are thousands of archaeological findings that back up the events of the Bible. The Cyrus Cylinder and the Moabite Stone are just a couple examples that show that what is said in the Old Testament happened. For the second test, the authentication of the biblical texts, particularly those of the New Testament, have been proven to be written in a reliable format. In fact, there is a portion of John's gospel 
found on a parchment dating as early as the second century. To put that into perspective, concerning ancient world writings, the earliest manuscripts for the works of Socrates, Plato's, and Aristotle are over 1,000 years after their death. That's the earliest manuscripts. F.J.A. Hort, a biblical text scholar, said that other than grammatical and spelling differences, no more than one thousandth part of the New Testament differs from earlier manuscripts. So there is archaeological evidence that the events of the Bible happened. And there is textual evidence that the words of Scripture have remained the same. So let's go back to those questions that popped up at the end of the first section. My Bible is different from your Bible. How do we know which Bible is Scripture? The same test that we're supposed to do with news and scientific discoveries can apply to understanding what portions of the Bible are reliable. Test everything you hear about God against the Word of God. 1 John 4, 1 through 4, says it plainly. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in flesh from God, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The Holy Spirit guides us to truth. Prayer and meditation help us to hone in on the Spirit's guidance to the truth of God from God. Scripture is the truth of God from God. So the third question, how can we use Scripture? If you'll turn with me to 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's also look over at Isaiah 1, <laughs> Isaiah, Psalm 119. Good luck finding Isaiah 119. It's one of those non existent books we need to be on the watch for. Isaiah 119, again, Psalm 119. I'm confusing myself, but we'll get there eventually. Psalm 119, 103 to 106. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light from my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. So, in 2 Timothy 3, we saw that we can use Scripture for teaching. Last summer, we went through the chapters of Acts and we heard a wonderful sermon about Philip meeting the Ethiopian. By God's guidance, Philip met a man who could not understand the scriptures he was reading. And so Philip taught him not just what the scripture said, but also helped him understand 
how to understand Scripture in the future. The gift of the Holy Spirit guides us, even when we don't have Jesus in person to guide us through the Word. Another use for Scripture is the rebuking. In Matthew 21, we read that Jesus overturned tables and disrupted businesses at the temple. He rebuked the sellers there, saying, you have turned the house of God into a den of thieves, quoting from a passage they should all know, Jeremiah 7, verse 11. Another use for Scripture is correcting. And it takes a little while, in my mind at least, to figure out what's the difference between rebuking and correcting. Well, I think Matthew 5 shows us the difference. See, Matthew 5 is what we call the Beatitudes. It's where Jesus says, You have heard it said, but I say to you. See, Jesus corrects the misunderstanding people have concerning the laws given to Moses. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and other religious rulers, they were so concerned about the letter of the law that they took it a step further and added their own letters of the law to prevent them from getting to the letters of the law. But in doing that, they completely rejected and missed the purpose of the law, the spirit of the law. And that's what Jesus did in Matthew 5. He corrected the teachings that these Israelites had heard from their religious leaders. And finally, another use for Scripture is training. And reading through the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, we get a clear picture of how Jesus trained his disciples. He used parables, he gave them signs. He explained passages of Scripture to them and anyone else that would listen. He wanted his followers to be prepared to follow him and his example even after he was taken back to heaven. So Scripture is designed to guide people to God. I want to close off the main portion of this sermon by looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. So we can use Scripture any day, any time, anywhere. God is with us and His Spirit will guide us no matter what we're going through, no matter what you've been through. He's ready to be there with you. So in conclusion, let God's Word guide you. The Bible is the trustworthy truth about God from God. Scripture alone teaches us that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of of God alone, and we owe everything to God, who gave His Son to die for our redemption. I want to close today by telling you about a dream I had the night before last. In my dream, my family, and some of you, were all attending a big cathedral-like church for a service. My youngest daughter was too young to be in the same nursery group as my oldest daughter, 
So I went to supervise my oldest daughter while my wife took care of our youngest daughter. At the end of the service, my wife came to get us from the nursery. But when we got outside, we realized that my oldest daughter had not followed us all the way out of the building. So I ran back into the big, crowded building to look for her, but I couldn't find her. I saw the group of kids that had been in the nursery with her, but she wasn't with them. I found myself on the outside of the church again, so I shouted for my daughter, hoping to hear some sort of response from her. I heard someone say, she's gone, she's probably dead. I did not appreciate that, but I was more concerned with finding her, so I kept looking around and calling her name. No response. At this point, I started to freak out, so I decided to go look around the roads to make sure she hadn't left the property, and I saw her across a road walking towards a small chicken coop. I rushed over to her, but as I get across the road, she turns into a small chicken. My dreams can be a bit weird sometimes. All right. I grab the chicken and I hold it close, hoping that my touch will turn her human again. But at the same time, I realize that I'm just holding a chicken. And I need to give up this foolishness and keep looking for my daughter. So I release the chicken and continue my search. I notice a bear cub walking towards a pond. But my brain is screaming at me, don't let yourself be distracted. I need to find my girl. So I start sprinting back to the building, hoping that I will be able to find her in the maze of rooms and hallways throughout the building. I can hear the voice of Pastor Robin talking to a few late stragglers. You know who you are. <laughs> so I run to him, and I ask him to look for my daughter with me. Everyone still in the building starts helping me look for my daughter, and I notice a small open latch on a closed metal door. I try the door and find that it opens onto a roof patio. I call out for my daughter, and behind me, I hear my daughter's voice. I turn, and I see her standing behind a railing on a balcony just a few feet above my reach. One of the people helping me look for her manages to find a way onto the balcony. He picks her up and places her in my arms. The moment she was in my arms, I was never going to let her go. So why do I tell you this dream? Because there's four things from my dream that I want you to think about. First, unlike me, God had never lost you. He's always known exactly where you are, but he can't be with you until you make the choice to answer his call. Second, God will not accept any substitutes for you. He wants you. He's not satisfied with chickens or bears. He wants you. Third, God provides people in our lives to help us. And if you need help, there are people here at Oxford Baptist Church that want to help you. Please, reach out. And finally, once you are in God's arms, He will never let you go. Never. And Scripture teaches us that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you gave up so much for us. You were not willing to accept sacrifices of animals. You were not willing to accept one or two humans. You want all of us. And for that, you paid the ultimate price. You love us so much, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that guides us to you. We thank you for your word that guides us to you. We pray, Lord, that your spirit touch the hearts and lives of everyone here. Those who are saved, may we have the wisdom and the courage to go out and preach your gospel. And to those who are missing you, Lord, may we have the humbleness to break down, confess our sins, and let you 
take charge of our life. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have in this country to serve you openly. And we pray for all your children that are in closed countries, that you give them the wisdom and the strength to serve you wholeheartedly so that your world may be known. In Jesus' name, amen.